there's a particular type of grief that was revealed during my research on what I eventually named family scapegoating abuse or FSA. It's a type of grief you rarely hear discussed, a lot of people don't know about, but that adult survivors of family scapegoating experience. And that's what I'll be talking about today in this week's episode of Beyond Family Scapegoating Abuse, so stick around. Welcome to my channel. I'm Rebecca Mandeville. I'm a family systems expert and author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed, Help and Hope for Adults in the Family Scapegoat Role. And when I began researching on what I eventually named family scapegoating abuse um, or FSA, it was clear that many people um, that I was seeing in forums and on social media understandably felt a lot of rage, anger, um, felt all kinds of feelings related to being scapegoated in their family once they figured out that's what was going on. But it was rare that I saw people talking about grief. Grief was one of the things that I researched on um, in my qualitative research studies. Uh, qualitative studies are based on people's lived experiences or their lived reality. And I, uh, I personally and professionally greatly value qualitative research because I wanted, I wanted to know what people who are scapegoated in their families experience and are there commonalities, differences. Um, so I had several comp comprehensive surveys. My last one, um, gosh, I collected respondents um, answers for a year, a full year. I have over a thousand respondents on that particular survey, the last one I did. So I have a lot of information from these different surveys and grief really stood out to me because it, it did not come up with that particular word being used uh, with the different uh, people responding to my surveys who were scapegoated, but it was really woven into every word of their survey responses. And no wonder, of course, there's losses associated with being scapegoated by your family, profound losses, as I've described in earlier videos and in my book. Um, but the type of grief that I decided that was most fitting for adult survivors of family scapegoating is a grief called disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief is a term uh, that Ken Doka, a grief researcher, came up with, and he did quite a bit of work uh, with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and many people know her, um, Five Stages of Grief, uh, which was actually, th that those studies were done on people who were dying. Um, some people think it's from the family or loved ones, but on the stages someone dying goes through. Um, and so Ken Doka, D-O-K-A, in 1989, um, he began researching and writing about disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief is experienced when someone suffers a loss that is not or cannot be openly acknowledged, socially sanctioned, or publicly mourned. That's what we're gonna talk about today. And um, I'd also like to comment that I know grief is talked about in relation to scapegoating. Uh, I have seen other people talking about that, which is great. Uh, the term I most often see used is estrangement grief. I don't like to use that term because for me, uh, as someone who knows this both personally and professionally and walk a similar path to my clients uh, and have for years, estrangement grief to me suggests that I might 
uh, I might be grieving or one is grieving the loss of certain relationships or loss of family relationships. And that may be true, but not always. Um, some people, to be honest, they celebrate uh, when they can extract themselves from abusive relationships, when they can have the boundaries needed to uh, cease contact with people who are not loving toward them. And when they step back, they realize, well, was the relationship ever loving? What was the relationship based on? Maybe I had to be fawning, submitting, accommodating. The other person was bullying or narcissistic or controlling. So I don't see it as estrangement grief in all cases. Sometimes, certainly, it is. Uh, there may be estrangement, grief associated with lost connections with nieces, nephews, uh, people connected to the uh, people, th those in your life who were uh, scapegoating you. But what I wanted to put in my book on family scapegoating abuse and in my research was information on disenfranchised grief because. I don't think this type of grief is recognized in scapegoated people. I think scapegoated people often don't recognize it in themselves. And I think sometimes people can get stuck in anger or what I call righteous rage um, in part because that is can be an unconscious defense mechanism so that the grief isn't felt Grief can feel so overwhelming for some disempowering, makes them feel really vulnerable. One might feel more empowered if they stay in the anger or in that righteous rage. It's definitely a stage in recovery we need to pass through. This showed up in Kubler-Ross's research as well, anger. But grief, to fully heal uh, and transcend these family scapegoating dynamics and the trauma and the uh, intrapsychic wounds that are experienced in association with FSA. Grief is a passage we must allow ourselves to experience, to fully feel not only lost connections, lost love, or that one was not ever loved in the first place because they had perhaps a very um, personality disordered parent, very emotionally immature parent, or a mentally ill parent, sociopathic parent, which can happen. So sometimes the grief is associated more with the fact that one cannot get public support um, one's pain is not recognized or understood. As I have said more than once, the family scapegoating abuse adult survivors don't have a hashtag me too mo moment. Um, I'm sure that will come, uh, but there has not been that overwhelming recognition socially, that public support and what usually happens is there's a stage that family scapegoating abuse survivors go through where they finally see what's happening. They may even learn about family systems. They recognize they're in that scapegoat role or identification, identified patient role um, in the family. And sometimes people very excitedly think if they tell parents or siblings what they've discovered. I've had um, people in this stage actually give my book <laughs> to family, uh, which doesn't turn out too well for them um, <laughs> because I'm the crazy therapist who wrote this crazy book uh, about things that are not true. It doesn't matter that I've researched on, on this or people in the family systems field have researched on the identified patient for half a century, but we're all crazy. You know, that again is another defense mechanism. People don't want to see the truth of how their behavior has been harmful and harmed someone in the family. Um, so trying to tell the family, get that validation, get the recognition, have the hurt uh, acknowledged, have the grief recognized, I, I can't think of too many cases where that's worked out very well for the 
FSA adult survivor. The family's too defended, whether it's because they're narcissistically structured or that family projective identification process is going on that I often mention, mention that's associated with highly traumatized, dysfunctional families. Usually these families have a tremendous amount of intergenerational trauma. So they're not, they don't have the ears to hear, the eyes to see uh, what their behaviors have led to in regard to a family member who now is traumatized through family scapegoating abuse. Uh, that doesn't mean that your grief is not real, whether it's estrangement grief or disenfranchised grief, but disenfranchised grief leaves someone so isolated because not only do people not understand what you've experienced in your family, they can't understand the pain that's associated with this form of abuse, nor can their minds wrap around the losses. The scapegoated adult survivor has trouble wrapping their mind around the losses because it can feel so overwhelming. If you feel it all, you, you, on some level might wonder if you could ever live through the pain. This is why grief is often kept at bay. There can be a fear that unconsciously, if we let the floodgates you know, down and that grief water comes rushing through, it will overwhelm us like a, a, a river with a mighty current and it will sweep us away. I'd like to take a little bit of time now and talk about disenfranchised grief and what my research revealed the scapegoated adult experiences in relation to family scapegoating abuse. Based on my years of experience working with clients in my psychotherapy and coaching practices, along with my research, I had a clear picture that the disenfranchised grief is associated with, but not limited to the following circumstances. Number one would be lost family connections. As I mentioned, um, you may have had to limit or end contact with family, which you may feel good about, but there may also be people associated with those family members that it feels that you would be too vulnerable keeping and maintaining connections with them or they might believe the scapegoat narrative. So it just feels too, you know, like you're still getting that projection energy, um, some looks in the eyes or comments that show um, extended family, uh, other family member have been swept up into this narrative. So there can be profound losses just in regard to any family connections at all, which can contribute to one feeling very isolated. Secondly, lost community and social connections. I know many FSA survivors felt they had no choice but to relocate, uh, sometimes to a different neighborhood in the same town, sometimes to a different state, sometimes to a different country. And that is what they felt they needed to do to get out from this huge umbrella of the scapegoat narrative that was always raining down on them. So they may have left communities, hobbies, activities, friendships as part of their decision to move. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you just did a, ge a geographic location change and trying to cure things with that. And that never works. Well, you know what? For scapegoated adult survivors, it actually can help a lot and quote unquote work and help people to rebuild their lives where they're not under that shadow of the scapegoat narrative. Uh, number three, not being recognized as a griever, being viewed as the cause of their grief. This can happen. Um, well, of course, you're sad. You cut off your family. You should never have cut them off. Now you're sad and lonely. Your problem. Yeah, I know people who have heard that. It's, a, you know, <laughs> talk about pouring salt into the wound. 
um, you'll get challenged by people. Did you really have to end contact? You know, your family's supposed to be there for you. Are you sure you were reading things right? Are you sure you just didn't imagine all of this? So that's a big one in regard to disenfranchised grief. Number four, grief is masked by intense feelings of anger, betrayal, and hurt. And that is, again, as I mentioned earlier, understandable. We need to go through that passage of righteous anger, righteous rage, but we can get stuck there again because grief can make us feel so vulnerable where a newfound sense of anger or righteous rage, this is wrong, what happened to me and my family can feel very empowering. So it's easy to understand why people would rather stay there. But if you miss this grieving passage, I have found personally and professionally, your recovery is a bit limited. Um, the grief does need to be felt and processed and released. Hopefully with a supportive therapist or support group, um, it is nice when you can have support. Number five, feeling isolated in your FSA experiences. Um, as I pointed out in my book, as my research validated on FSA, family scapegoating abuse can be very, very subtle and insidious. It can be um, invisible. It's what we call it, invisible abuse. It's psycho-emotional abuse. It doesn't leave visible scars, bruises. It can be done behind closed doors when no one's watching. It also can happen right in front of you when you're there. Um, uh, again, I do like to stress this because it came up so much in my research, even in a little poll that I did on our community page here on YouTube. Uh, um, part of the poll in the beginning, there was about 38% of the people were saying, I was scapegoated right in front of me when I was in the room. My parent had no trouble saying she's a liar, she's this or he's that right in front of me when I was there. So it does not always happen behind your back. It does not always happen behind closed doors. Uh, I don't know, maybe narcissistic abuse does, but not family scapegoating abuse. And that's why it's important to distinguish FSA from narcissistic abuse. The two can be related, but family scapegoating abuse has distinct qualities, which make it not always just like and the same as narcissistic abuse. And one of those distinct qualities is, yeah, you can have scapegoating behaviors happen in the room when you're there. Um, I know I know cases where the parents, as soon as a new um, someone was, you know, you're dating someone, you bring them home and within five minutes, the parents telling the scapegoat story. Oh, Janie was such a difficult baby and she was so colicky and oh, her father was drinking and I had to work full time and I, and she was just such a difficult child and you're just sitting there paralyzed listening to this and your date that you brought home is probably very confused and <laughs> you may think twice before bringing someone home again after that happens. Um, and I know that's happened to many clients of mine, both when they were teens and as adults. So feeling um, the sense of, of isolation in your experiences, feeling like your pain's discounted, invalidated, dismissed, feeling that society doesn't even understand or acknowledge your particular form of invisible abuse as a scapegoated child or adult child. That is, uh, that that and all of these things that I put into my book here where I'm reading from uh, are part of disenfranchised grief in relation to family scapegoating abuse. Uh, so I hope that this research I've done, that this little chapter in my book and my discussion today as well as an article that Dr. Aaron Watson is posting on my blog this weekend that I hope you'll take time to read. I'm going to be putting it in the video description and in the pinned comment. Uh, it's a very full, lengthy article, covers some things the chapter in my book on disenfranchised grief doesn't cover. So I hope you make time to read her article on disenfranchised grief and scapegoating because it's through 
um, articles like Dr. Watson's through discussions like this, uh, the chapter in my book and uh, these YouTube videos. And I'm sure there's other therapists and uh, clinicians who do, do talk about this. And so with all of us together, bringing grief, uh, the grief of the scapegoated adult survivor, how this needs to be recognized, it needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be socially acknowledged. You know, let's acknowledge what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise awareness like a grassroots movement to get this brought to people's attention, the travesty of family scapegoating and what it can lead to for people who have such profound isolation. They may not even feel life is worth living. That's how bad it can get. If they don't have support systems, they don't have money for high quality therapy, trauma informed therapy. It's, you know, narcissistic abuse really was fueled by uh, the awareness people have of it today was fueled by grassroots movement where a lot, lots and lots of people on Twitter were talking about it. Sam Backman was in, he's the first one I knew talking about narcissistic abuse. He may have made that term. I think he made the term malignant narcissist. And from there, you know, over time, it just took off. And we can do the same for family scapegoating abuse or whatever term people want to use. Uh, but that's what I like to call it. Because if you say narcissistic abuse, you're leaving out a lot of elements that are specifically associated with family scapegoating abuse, including the family projective identification process, which has been researched on for many, many years in the family systems field, which uh, contributes to the creation of what in family systems we call the identified patient role. And that also mirrors and is similar and the same as in some cases, uh, the family scapegoat role. So if you got something out of this video, please hit the thumbs up so YouTube knows to uh, let people know about my channel. And you'll also be notified of my videos, which come out every Saturday morning. If you go back and click the white bell on the subscriber tab so you can get an email notifying you. I released a video, but in general, I get a video out, video out every Saturday morning. If not, I let people know on my community page. If you haven't subscribed, I hope you do. And if you know people who would benefit from this channel or my book, please tell them about it. If you're on forums, feel free to share links. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.